and welcome to the documentary on the Scottish Wars of Independence. Today, with me, your host, Nicola Violet, we will be going through all the things that happened in Scotland and England and the relationship with the two countries between the years 1280 and 1330, which covers about 50 years in history. But before we start, let's think about what happened beforehand. The Picts, also known as the Celts, were in power for the entire of Ireland, England and Wales, and as well as Scotland, now known as the United Kingdom of Ireland also known as the Republic of Ireland. These people lived in different tribes, always falling out with each other, until the Romans came and they all agreed on the one thing, that they all hated Roma. The Romans left eventually from England, which was the only country of the four that they conquered. The Romans left at around 410 AD. And then the Vikings and the Anglo-Saxons came and they colonized, well not colonized, they took and changed the lives of all the people who lived there, their language and the way of, their way of life. The Vikings and the Anglo-Saxons changed the way that Scotland, England, Ireland and Wales lived. England even got its name from them, Angleland, the land of the Angles. This now lives on today, which may, and brought Scotland together as one nation rather than multiple Celtic tribes. But now let's get back to the story of the Scottish War of Independence. It all began with the mean Alexander III, who was mean by the fact that he mistimed his death so that he would die and he had no male heir. This wouldn't have been a problem now, but it was then, because then they were sexist and they believed that they could only have a male king and they couldn't have a female queen. The only living, only living relative and person who could inherit the throne from him was Margaret, the maid of Norway. It was planned so when Margaret was old enough, she would inherit the throne and would take the crown and be queen of Scotland, and that he, she would marry Edward the first son, Edward the second. That would mean that their children would inherit. The throne of England, Scotland and Wales which had been conquered by England. This meant that they had that Scotland and England would both be united as they are now. But if we know it didn't happen then in twelve or eighty so well it happened differently. But still, as I say, that was the deal. When Margaret was old enough, the world looked very well. Margaret was going to marry Edward when she go home to Scotland. But the problem was, as she was on her boat to Scotland, she died on the way. Very tragically, this also meant the, the death of one girl caused the death of many Scots and English in the Scottish War of Independence. Fights broke out between the 15 people who were asked to govern Scotland while Margaret grew up to become the Queen of Scotland. After she died, this meant that there was no heir and that the 15 people had to battle it out between themselves on who would be the next King of Scotland. Because they couldn't decide, they would put it to an election now, but not that they could do that then, uh, but still. They were put it to an election, but not that then. Then they decided and called over Edward I, the King of England, to be the referee 
and to pick the next King of Scotland. Two main contestants was John Balliol and Robert the Bruce. The Balliol family and the Bruce family were very big enemies. But as Edward, he wasn't picking the strongest king for Scotland because he was worried he was creating himself an enemy. He created and purposefully chose the weak, the worst and weakest ruler, not the weakest. But anyway, the weakest ruler was John Balliol, as he wasn't the best leader of wars. He picked John Balliol on purpose because he planned to storm Scotland. Anyway, it was a big mistake for the Scots in the first place to ask him, but Edward took advantage of that as well. They could, Edward could have been the nice one, but he actually took advantage of the fact that the Scots had made a big mistake. After all the Scots had taken Edward as their overlord, they, Edward decided to attack France. France was England's biggest enemy and one of Scotland's allies against fighting the English as they both had the big thing in common that they hated the English. But Edward wanted backing with this. He wanted backing from the Scots and the army because he didn't have enough money and resources to attack Scotland alone. The Scottish refused to attack France, their biggest ally. Why would they attack their biggest ally? The Scottish instead made an alliance with the French, saying, if the English attack us, give us backing. If the English attack you, we'll attack again from behind. This showed that the two nations were bigger allies, bigger allies than, than England and Scotland were. This now meant that Edward had to do something and what he did was attack France. Edward was humiliated with what the Scots had done with the French. What he wanted to do was have revenge and that was what he got. He invaded Scotland, imprisoned John Balliol and tore off the Scottish flag from him and made him apologise to him. For first, this was horrible to the Scots, and afterwards, as a side effect, he took over Scotland and forced many of the most important people of Scotland at the time to sign to his total obedience. The Ragman Rolls was signed, with many people on it, like Bishop Wishart, who was one of the most important bishops at the time. There was no king again. Scotland was in dismay. They needed a leader. And that was what some man called William Wallace gave them. William Wallace was from a minor noble family. And his family showed that they could change the course of history. Wallace was approved by Bishop Wishart to give him the time to plan and to overthrow the English while Wallace was on the front line fighting. This worked very well. Andrew Maury, who was another person who had been leading rebellions in the far north of Scotland, merged with Wallace after he had killed an unpopular English sheriff and gained much support from it. This showed that they were ready to fight the English at Stirling Bridge. Even though they were hugely outnumbered, this battle would show one of the biggest battles in the Scottish history. Because what the English were trying to do was to cross Stirling Bridge to get down to their fi la last land in the far north of Scotland and take it as a stronghold to regain the north of Scotland. But this failed. Wallace and Maury faced Edward I at Stirling Bridge. As Edward's troops ran across the bridge, the bridge collapsed. This meant that Wallace 
had a huge advantage that hundreds of the English had just drowned and that they probably had scattered because of this. Wallace won Stirling Bridge and is one of the most monumental Scottish battles. This showed that anything could be achieved. Wallace became a Scottish legend and went down in history for Scotland. Wallace and Maury were both declared guardians of Scotland. With their guardianship, this meant that they were there to defend Scotland before they took a proper king. It was temporary, but it still worked for the time. They ruled Scotland and defended from the English for a while. It's held out. Wallace and Maury had merged in one sterling and now they were governing their, their country together. This was big stepping, and this meant that Scotland was independent again, or at least some of it. Later after being declared guardian, Maury died, leaving Wallace as the technical leader and king and dictator of Scotland. It takes us for okay then, at least they weren't exactly just but they were in the fact no one would try to overthrow you. But anyway, Wallace was the final guardian of Scotland then. He was the only one. He was preparing for a big battle against Edward, another battle that would go down in history in Scotland. The history that we are talking about right now in this documentary on the Scottish Wars of Independence. After seeing the amazing victory that Wallace had brought at Stirling Bridge, this now meant that Robert the Bruce, a previous contender for the Scottish crown, went and joined Wallace. Wallace and Robert joined forces. Robert had previously been defending Carlisle Castle for Edward I, but it joined Wallace because he thought it was the right thing to do to defend his homeland, Scotland. Robert was now with Wallace, even though he wasn't punished for it later on, he did lose his lands in England. In Falkirk, which was where the battle happened, Robert lost with Wallace, and Wallace blessed with his life ran away. It might have been that this time that the battlefield hadn't been sparkled with pixie dust. Wallace lost dramatically. The English forces outnumbered him. It is thought that this happened because of Edward's good use of Welsh longbowmen. Wallace was in exile. He had just lost the battle. After resigning his guardianship, he went to France for reinforcements from the French. Wallace was now losing. Wallace would rise again and come to Scotland, but he would never be as big as he was after Stirling. Edward was happy with his victory at Falkirk, but he was angry that Wallace had got away to France. But he still had the trick up his sleeve. He made an alliance with Robert the Bruce and John Corman, yes, Corman, the two current guardians of Scotland. This meant that he could put a price on Wallace's head, and whoever captured him or caught him, dead or alive, would be paid tribute from Edward. Wallace came back from France. He hid in Scottish forests and ran away from Edward's army many times. This worked for quite a long time. Wallace was back in Scotland and preparing to lead the rebellion. After running away for some time, two years to be precise, Wallace was finally captured and executed by Edward in 13. 1305, after returning to Scotland in 1303, 1305 
the walnut was executed in London and had his head put on a spike on London Bridge, which is quite horrible in my opinion. The current two guardians of Scotland, which is Robert the Bruce and John Corman, began to fight. They began to fight in their guardianship. They were the two most important people in Scotland, sharing a very important role as guardians, and they were big enemies. Now, they began to fight. Although the priest, one of the priests, was added to try to settle the argument between them, this didn't work. Due to the events, this meant that Robert the Bruce one of the earlier contendants for the Scottish throne, defeated by John Balliol, was kicked out as guardian. He was no longer guardian. This was devastating for him, although he probably was, I weren't there. So yes, he was kicked out from his guardianship. Even though Robert had lost his guardianship, he knew he had to do something with um, John Coleman. Um, so what he did with Coleman was he asked him if any of us go for the title as king, they must surrender their land to the other, which means whoever gained in land would, no, whoever gained in title would lose in land, and whoever lost the chance of gaining in title would gain in land. This seemed fair. Robert had earlier sworn loyalty to Edward. This was very much going against the fact that he had sworn loyalty to him. But the problem was, John Common probably knew that, and what he did was he had probably gone and told Edward that Robert had done that. And he did that, and Edward found the first found out that Robert had done that, some would say at least, when Robert was in London. And the mayor of London, who was one of Robert's close friends, gave him a penny that had the king's face on it, and also gave him a pair of shoes. This meant run from the king, Robert. Run. Robert had betrayed Edward. John Coleman was his rival. He had no one to turn to. He was angry with John as he had supposedly snitched on him to Edward. This meant that he had to work it out with him. A bishop arranged them both to meet in the church to work it out. In medieval times, if you wanted to meet with someone you didn't trust, the best place to do that was a church. This was because they believed it was God's house, and it would be a sin to commit any crime or lie there. Now, this normally this principle normally applied, but as they were talking, Robert lost his temper with John, as he wasn't admitting that he had snitched, even though Robert thought he did. And because of this, Robert lashed out and killed John Coleman. Robert was in great danger. If he didn't move fast, he would get crushed by the Coleman family in Edward I. He couldn't hide in Scotland because the Coleman family would find him there. He couldn't hide in England because Edward was no longer his ally. He had to move fast. And that's what he did. What he did was he contacted, not contacted, well, he asked the Scottish Church to, to give him forgiveness for his sin of what he had done to Coleman. And this happened. Bishop Wishet, the current bishop, a very dominant bishop at the time of the Coleman. Anyway, as you were saying, the current, uh, current bishop forgave him for what he did. This meant 
that Robert could be crowned King Robert I of Scotland. The English thought they'd done enough for them to cra crowning Robert, King Robert I, but they hadn't. They had captured a bishop and had the right to crown Scottish kings. But what they didn't know was that they crowned Robert, King Robert I, secretly in Schoon Abbey, where the stone of Schoon used to lay until the English took it. After Robert was crowned king, Edward came and defeated him in the Battle of Meenhaven. Robert was forced into exile. His wife and his daughter were captured and four of his brothers were executed. Robert was in disgrace. He had to do something. He was losing the battle that he thought he had won after being crowned. Robert the First, King of Scots. Robert returned to land and started the long journey to regain Scotland. Edward was still in England, preparing to take him home, but he was ill and he was dying. As Edward lay on the border of Scotland, looking forward what he had gained and what he had lost. Edward died in Carlisle, looking at the Scottish border between England and Scotland. This now meant that Edward II, who was supposed to marry Margaret the Maid of Norway if he hadn't died, was now King of England, preparing to take on the Scots. Robert had avoided open battle with the English because his army was smaller and weaker. Regaining castle by castle, battle by battle, he managed to regain most of Scotland. But then trouble was brewing when Edward II's army came in to face the Scots. After Edward and Robert agreed to battle, Robert had the advantage of being able to pick the battleground. Although he had for a very long time, he had tried to avoid open battle. But now, the future of Scotland lay in the hands of an open battle with the English. He picked Bannockburn, a swamp. A, this swamp was very easy to trap the English. He trapped the English, took down the archers, and defeated the king. And Edward was sent away back to England after losing the Battle of Bannockburn, which marked Scottish independence. After declaring St Andrew the parentage saint of Scotland, they sent the Treaty of Albroath to the Pope. They hoped that this meant they did would acknowledge Scotland as an independent nation and stop the English from invading. It worked, as the fact that they had made Andrew their painted saint of Scotland. Andrew was the brother of Peter, the founder of the Catholic Church. This meant that the Pope was probably, and did, say that he agreed with the Treaty of Albroath. Edward I's nobles were angry. They were angry, and his wife was angry as well. His wife and his lo and his wife's lover, not Edward II himself, actually, worked together in a plot to kill Edward II. They assassinated him by sticking a red hot poker up his bottom. It would have hurt a lot. <laughs> it's quite funny though. 
after many years of war with the English, Edward III agreed in the Treaty of Edinburgh, in, signed in Edinburgh, well, that was obvious, that to give up all his claim to the Scottish throne and to declare peace with the Scots. This now meant that Scotland was an independent nation, and this now meant that Scotland was Scotland, independent from the English, with no more attacks. Now Edward III was King of England, and Robert the Bruce was Robert I of Scotland. After his long and successful reign, Robert, who was very ill, died. Many people said when he was ill, he could only move his tongue. Robert was ill, although his illness was coming and going, but it was coming more than it was going. Well, that's kind of impossible because it was already there. Let's not get too literal. Robert had died. But now Scotland was an independent nation, and all he had achieved to bring Scotland as an independent nation from England would hold for 200 years. Let's skip forward about 200 years in history to the year fifth, no, si to the year 1603, when Queen Elizabeth I, Queen of England, died. She had beheaded her cousin Mary, Queen of Scots, when she had thought that she was plotting to kill her. Sco Although Scotland had been raging in civil war, James I was king. James I was Elizabeth's cousin once removed, as Mary was Elizabeth's direct cousin, and James was Ma Mary's son. But that meant that when Elizabeth died, her only living relative was the Stuart, James Stuart, who became James I of Scotland and England. No, James the first, James the sixth of Scotland and James the first of England. Don't get your date wrong, Nicola. After we skip forward another two hundred years in history and the Act of Union, the United England of Scotland is Great Britain. Uh, this held place until nineteen ninety nine when Scotland sort of went back in time. They wanted independence, and they're still pushing for it now. But in 1999, Scotland created Scottish Parliament, which could control Scotland a little bit independent of the British government. And Scotland is still pushing for another referendum after the defeat in the referendum in 2016. Nicola Sturgeon, the Prime Minister of Scotland, is pushing for another referendum on Scottish independence. And thank you for watching.